welcome to Metalnet. I have a very special guest today, Kane Roberts. How are you doing, Kane? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. I I just woke up and I realized that I was supposed to do an interview with you at three o'clock and it was 2.59. <laughs> so you were nice enough to push it to five o'clock and now I'm half awake. So it's perfect. Yeah, I'm That's doing great. good. Perfect. It's perfect. That's awesome. Yeah. So let's just start with my latest discovery about you, which is that you were uh, born and raised in Newton, Massachusetts, yes. which is like maybe an hour away from where I am now and where I grew up. So tell me a little bit about growing up in Newton. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it, you know, as, as a kid, I was always an outsider. You know, I was always, um, you know, a little bit off the grid, you know, they, my friends were always uh, kind of like disaffected, you know, even for that age of like junior high school and high school, we kind of observed things, if that makes sense. And, you know, my girlfriends were always, uh, you know, full on kind of, you know, hippie girls or just kind of these rebellious girls that I used to date and everything. And I, you know, I just remember um, I, uh, I heard, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, I heard, uh, uh, Led Zeppelin bands like that and it, it really clicked in my head I can't remember how young I was because you know my parents you know were very uh, conservative they're very like uh, you know the, their their whole look on life was you know go to school go to college learn a trade of some sort some profession and then you know go to work and get in the system so uh, it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't very comfortable for them that I, I immediately started you know gravitating towards the antithesis of all that. So, um, but I have to be honest with you, when I was um, when I was very young, I knew I was going to play guitar for the rest of my life. Now, you know, I didn't have that kind of you know I'm thinking fifty years, twenty years, ten years down the road, but that sort of vision of who I am and what's important to me in terms of priorities uh, never faded. So it was very, it was like, like a sort of a, an early uh, transition into, into uh, you know, a different kind of a lifestyle. So, yeah. And was Newton, I mean, I think of Newton as a somewhat well-to-do, definitely conservative, you know, kind of conventional sort of place. Was it like that when you were a kid or was it different in the, like the 70s? Um, you know, there, there, was a, there was a different thing going on back then. So uh, I think I, uh, my youth was spent always, um, kind of uh, not paying attention to what I was supposed to do. I mean, um, you know, my, my parents were always uh, amazed that I just never did what they told me to do. I was one of, you know, my, my dad would say, be home by 10, I'd come home the next day, or, you know, it was just one of those things. So there was a certain point where they sort of stepped off, you know? I think there was one year in, in high school, I, I, I don't know how many days I went, but it was very few, I just didn't go, you know, I, I just didn't, I, I, it didn't, uh, uh, it didn't work with me. I went to Newton North High School, which is, which was, uh, which was really good. But then we moved. And I think when you move in the middle of high school, your whole social structure gets diminished even more, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that point, I just I wasn't interested in going to high school at all. So um, I did eventually get into uh, Boston University, but I think I was there for like, you know, a month before I switched over to the New England Conservatory. And the thing is that, that uh, you know, you, you, you think about your parents and what they were into and what they were supportive of or whatever, you know, they ponied up and they paid for my, uh, for my school at uh, the New England Conservatory, which was predominantly a, a classical school. Mm. But, um, you know, I was in the contemporary music division, which meant that a lot of times I'd go to, you know, to a, some sort of a, a work, up, work class where you're supposed to meet with a bunch of musicians and play. And I'd look in the window and there'd be somebody there filling out a McDonald's uh, application for a job. So, you know, this the contemporary part of New England Conservatory was kind of fucked up back then. But I got to meet and play with a lot of great classical musicians, which was a good discipline for me. My, my guitar teacher was a uh, classical guitarist that often sat in with the Boston Symphony. So he was oh, kind wow. of, he was instrumental in making me understand my instrument. No, I'm sorry. I, I, as soon as I said instrumental, I knew I was in trouble. So, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about that because I had heard. Uh, so you went, you got into BU, which means you must have done pretty well in school. Otherwise, they wouldn't. I guess I did okay for never going. I did okay. Yeah. And then what was your like when you went to BU? What was your intention? What was your major when you thought you were going to be at BU for four years? Well, I, I really didn't want to go. 
but you know, I, I was kind of one of those generic students. Like I got in, I remember my counselors were saying, were you interested in English and literature, and social uh, stuff or history? And I just said no to all of it. But I, I think I ended up, uh, you know, being some kind of a history major or whatever. And it literally lasted two months. I'm not kidding you. I just, I wasn't interested at all. So, you know, it was basically, well, what the fuck do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to go to the New England Conservatory, which, you know, uh, <clears throat> strange enough was the, the best humanities class I ever had was at the conservatory. I had this teacher, he was uh, teaching us, you know, history. So he took the New Testament of the Bible and treated it like a novel, which I thought was interesting. So we read pretty much all of it. So people say like, oh, you know, did you ever study the Bible? I say, yes, but you know, it was kind of like uh, some, some book that somebody wrote, like a novel. In other words, he wasn't, he wasn't into saying it was correct or if it was bad. It was just an interesting thing to, to analyze the writing style and what was going on culturally at that time. So, uh, but that, you know, and believe it or not, that was at a music school. My, my greatest experience there was my guitar teacher. And, you know, and I'll never forget, he would bring in sometimes these instruments from the museums, these, these ancient lutes and guitars. And he would, you know, play them and show me different techniques on them. And one time I said, hey, could I, can I play the lute? And he said, okay, and this thing was hundreds of years old. So I picked it up and see his big move with me is I wasn't supposed to put my thumb around the neck of the guitar. See what I mean? You're not supposed to do that. He wanted my hand like this for better access to all the strings. So he was really a strict disciplinarian. And he had one of those pens, was really dork pens with like nine different colors of ink. Yeah, so thing weighed that. like a pound, you know? <laughs> and so, I, you know, if my thumb went over there on the guitar, he would hit my thumb Thank with you. it, you know? <laughs> so I'm playing this ancient lute and he sees my thumb and he whacks my thumb, but I move my thumb and he actually hit the guitar. Oh no. <laughs> and I'll never forget, he would give me that. You know what I mean? So that was, <laughs> wasn't a good day for us. But yeah, no, he, he was, uh, he's one of the reasons why, um, you know, a lot of guitar players, I mean, if they're, if they're listening to this, the, the thing you want to do is when you play guitar, like this is my guitar now, you don't want to think of it this way. You want to think of it this way. So like you want to think instead of horizontal, you want to go vertical or vice versa, whatever. But so we would study these uh, Andre Segovia uh, exercise books where all the scales went from the top of the neck and then back down a different way. And I think that was one of the key reasons why I had, I had sort of a you know, uh, a half decent understanding of the neck because the guitar is almost like an abacus. Music is essentially math, you know? So, you know, you see these intervals of different spaces and, uh, you know, so I, I, I kind of got a good sense for the entire, uh, you know, the entire neck, which was, which was very important. Were you a good student? Like, were you so passionate about it that if he told you you had to learn it this way that you were down? Yes, but I wasn't into the tests, if that makes sense. I wasn't into it. And because, you know, um, it all seemed too structured for me. You know, I'll never forget, uh, I was, um, I had a final exam for music theory and I had the stuff aced. My, my teacher, the music theory teacher, you know, handed out these Bach fugues the first day and we had us all sight read, which I couldn't do, you know, because I, I was just, somebody that, you know, they accepted two guitar players the year I got accepted. Mm -hmm. So, but I wasn't somebody who was classically trained, so I couldn't do it. And he told me, you're going to, you're not going to make it through the year. So I said, okay, well, so, um, uh, so when it came time to, to sort of, you know, studying for the test and going there and being on time for this, this big moment in the course of a semester, mm -hmm. I found it to be uncomfortable for me. And I'll never forget one time, it was time to play it, to go to, I was across the street at a, a pinball arcade. And it was literally one minute away. And instead of going to test, I put my last quarter in and lost the game immediately. And I also missed the test. And for some reason I got sexually aroused. I never figured that out. But I think it had a lot to do with, you know, my true nature <laughs> about what I think about life, you know? That's amazing. So. So why the conservatory and not Berkeley? Because when I was a kid, and I think we have about 10 years yeah. between us, um, you know, all the kids I knew who played thought about Berkeley, whether or not they did or not is different, but Berkeley was- Yeah, they wanted to go to Berkeley, on. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so why the conservatory? 
Well, see, that was the thing. I told my dad, <clears throat> I want to play music. And he said, well, I don't want you going to Berkeley. Hmm. He said, you and I could both get into Berkeley today playing tuba. Right. He said, I want you to go to a place where you have to know what the hell you're doing, you know, to, in order to get in. He said, then we'll see, you know. And the thing is, he didn't want me to go. He wanted me to be a lawyer or something. So he figured, you know, whatever. This was is he hoping easy that you wouldn't get in secretly? Like and, and I got to tell you, Sarah, I, my interview was like, there was a movie called, I think it was Flashdance or something, mm -hmm. where the girl had to go in there and she was wearing a leotard and she did this dance in front of all these like famous teachers and performers. Well, I had to do that. I had to buy a leotard. I had to, no, I'm kidding. No, but I had to get in there in front of like the president of the school, this guy, Gunther Schuller, a very famous composer or, or conductor and all these jazz musicians and all these people. I didn't know that was like a board of people in front of me. And there was a little rhythm section behind me. So I had to play an original composition and, you know, I had to, uh, do some sight reading. And then I had to um, play uh, uh, a, a, some, some kind of a song. I forget what the song was. It might, I don't think it was a blues, but with the, with the band behind me. And while the band's playing, they're changing key every like, you know, 30 seconds. So I have to catch it. So, you know, with the sight reading and everything, I walked out of there literally dripping with sweat going, I, I didn't get in. And surprisingly, uh, I got in. So, uh, you know, I, I, the cool thing about, um, you know, one of the lessons I learned, you know, from my parents is, you know, he gave me my word. If I get in, if I get in, he'll pay for it. And, you know, I, I did get in and, you know, I got sexually aroused missing tests. So it turned out to be a good decision. Well, so. maybe that's maybe that's what got you through the four years is feeling that feeling those yeah. feelings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably constantly. But, by the way, I didn't graduate. I, I, I remember didn't. I was there. I was there with a uh, classical alto sax player really talented kid we were in a practice room and I said you know I, I was there for two and a half years and I said uh so are you going to graduate he goes yeah you know I have to. and I said why and he said because you know in in classical music you know, let's say there's four violinists in the main orchestra in town whatever town that is um you know they have to die for, for the seat to open and of course there's like a hundred violinists that you know, we're waiting to take the fourth slot or whatever it is. So uh, he said, you know, you got to learn to teach. And he, I said, so you're finishing school in order to teach. And he, he said, yeah. He said, that's the only reason to get a diploma because you can't walk into a record company and go, hey, I graduated. Yeah. You know, can I make an album? That, that doesn't work. So I kind of I kind of quit that day, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, pretty, pretty young. I, I moved out of my house and went to uh, moved to New York, to Manhattan. And then um, that's when, uh, you know, I kind of really learned the lessons of what it's like to try to make it in the music industry. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, <clears throat> I started doing studio work and playing all over. And then, uh, and then um, I got uh, a call from uh, Bob Ezrin and he asked me to come down and play uh, and meet Alice Cooper and see if it's possible that I would, you know, because I, I uh, a guy at a, <clears throat> excuse me, a company called uh, Screen Gems um, sent my tape to Ezra. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they responded to it. And then I, I, I uh, drove down, I drove to man, uh, you know, to hit to their office in Manhattan. Um, and I met, you know, Chef Gordon and Alice Cooper and Bob Ezrin and all these guys that changed culture, you know, they're, they're all like uh, superstars in that regard. So uh, I went down there and, you know, uh, and I've said this before, you know, because, uh, but I, I don't really get nervous in those situations. I feel like just take it as it comes. Each moment is going to present something. And, you know, uh, the, the sort of trepidation or fear you have walking into the unknown to me, if you take that out of life, life is very boring. You need that, that feeling of like, I don't know what the fuck's going to happen with this. I'm just going to go in and eat up the situation and see how it, 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 it works out. So, you know, when I went in, um, I met uh, Alice and we became best friends literally within 15 minutes. Very, very strange. You know, we, we just, it was almost like we knew each other already. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big thing for the management because Alice had just come out of a very severe rehab and uh you know i didn't know anything about it i just you know i just went hey yeah and we became friends and started recording and you know suddenly i was in uh maui writing an album with them so you know my life kind of flipped you know pretty pretty big time yeah. 
So yeah. we're definitely going to go into that because that's obviously a really important part of your <clears throat> career and an important part of yep. Alice Cooper's career. But I'm kind of wondering how you got there. So, you know, we talked a little bit about you, you know, as a younger musician, you went to school and you didn't feel that you needed to finish. You just wanted to move on. But I did wonder how old were you when you actually decided you wanted to be a musician? Like, what was the age and what what was your first instrument? Did you go straight to guitar? Yeah, no. Well, you know, as I mentioned, as a young kid, I thought, oh, man, I want to do that. And I'll never forget in ninth grade, I, I had a band together mm-hmm. and we played uh, some dance at the, at the school. Mm-hmm. And I, that's when I was, you know, I, I, I don't want to say that I had some sort of, uh, uh, you know, grand perception of, you know, what my life was going to be. But I, you know, now that I look back, the door was closed at that point. I was going to be a musician. I was going to play. Right. And so <clears throat> when I decided to go to music school, it, turned, it, was, it was the most kind of, uh, what would you say, standard or default version of a commitment to it. But right. if you think about it, it isn't really because most of those people I went to school with did not go into music. And I, I literally, the, the grand percentage of them, they, they, don't, they still play music a little bit, but very few turned it into any kind of a career. Be, and, and it's because of you know, how unforgiving that jet stream is. You know? so, um, but at a very young age, I, I got a guitar. And I remember it was a big, uh, heavy K guitar, K-A-Y guitar. It felt like it weighed a ton. It was too bad, it's impossible to play. Was you it know, electric or really, acoustic? Really, acoustic? What? Was it an acoustic guitar? No, it was an electric guitar. My first guitar was an electric guitar. And, um, you know, I tripped over myself running uh, to, to strap it on and, and play in my little crappy amp and everything. And then, you know, you know, it's really funny. Anybody that plays music, that first moment where, let's say, you're listening to one of your favorite bands and you're trying to learn one of the songs and you actually play something it sounds a little bit like the, the legit thing. You know, that was those, those moments I was, I just hungered for them all the time. And I, I remember a lot of them. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So, and you know, I, I just, it was one of those things where I knew I was going to be a musician very young. It wasn't until I left the conservatory that I realized I had to sort of, you know, sever my uh, comfort zone from my life and go somewhere, you know, I mean, to, to make money, I, I dealt cards at these, um, at these illegal card games, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we would go to a um, uh, different hotel every night, this is in New York, <clears throat> and they would, they would rent a conference room, and, you know, I would play a show, let's say at a club, and I'd make like, you know, eight bucks, you know, but then I would go to this, this hotel and go up there and the guy, one of the guys would show me where all the guns were. They were like, you know, hidden in different cabinets around the, uh, the uh, hotel room. And then I would deal cards and maybe every weekend I'd make anywhere from like 800 to 1500 bucks, which was awesome, you know? And that's how I, I that's how I survived. And, you know, it, it's, if you think about it, my, the, my income source was that, Right. And then my true life was music. music. And um, it was kind of a, a, a very uh, intense, you know, lifestyle that I was in. Because, you know, anytime you walk into a club and you have your, your little band there and you're playing, you never know what's going to happen. If fights break out. Right. People fucking hate you. <laughs> people love you. You know, whatever it is. It's right. crazy. So and I would you go were like that. 20-ish years old when you moved to New York, right? Yeah, so I'm sorry. Yeah, like I, was, that. I, was, yeah. I was that young. And, 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 you know, the thing is that, uh, you know, you go, I would go from that scene, you know, this, this like uh, intense cauldron of music and crazy drinking people into this room where there were guns everywhere, you know, just in case any problems <laughs> took place. So, you know, it was, it was a crazy lifestyle, but I think it really kind of set me up for what the music business really is, you know, yeah. it, it's not, uh, it's not an easy, easy ride, but you know, what happens is that you accept everything. There's nothing that can stop you. That's, that's, that's the commitment that had in, uh, occurred in me internally. Gotcha. Now you were, you were part <laughs> of, um, you were a major part of defining the metal that I grew up with. So I'm an eighties kid and I grew up with all the hair bands, metal edge, MTV, had bangers, ball, whole right. bit. And so one thing that always, I'm always curious about is that, so when I came into it, you know, there was you, and actually when I really discovered you was when, um, when um, Saints and Sinners came out, 
So oh. I, I, I like knew that you were the Alice Cooper guy, but I really experienced you through your own music first. But I still knew you as part of this um, group of people that kind of redefined metal because metal had been around, but it was a little bit different, right? When I was coming yeah. up. So what I always wonder is for you, um, when you were like 14 years old playing the guitar or even before that, just listening to music growing up, what were your influences? And then when you got to be in that place where you were defining metal for my generation, did you know that you were changing what came before you or were you just playing kind of, I mean, did you even listen to metal bands when you were coming up or was it just more rock? No, I, I, I listened rock to, band? I listened to, uh, to metal. I mean, I have to say, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin was was the big ticket item for me. You know, um, of course, you know when I heard uh, Van Halen, that was that was a an epiphany, so to speak. You know, um, but you know um, <clears throat> when I started uh, writing music, you know, really uh, the the fortunate thing is I, I was never in a cover band, and I'm not putting anybody down for doing that. I'm just saying that was never. You know that that seemed like more of a business decision as opposed to uh, as opposed to a creative decision. And you know anybody that plays music will tell you that um, you know if you if you are the one in the band that has to talk to the club owner, you got to book the gig, you got to get the money and pay the rest of the guys. It's it's eating away at your sort of uh, altruistic sort of purest version of why you play music because you're handling the business. Now you have to be a businessman. But I'm just saying, especially at that age, all my instincts, all the things that I thought of were kind of uh, just completely dedicated to music. And I knew I was going to be playing music. So the writing that I did and, and the songs that I did um, were uh, essentially um, just what I felt at the time. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I listened to Ozzy. I listened to, you know, I, you, you name it, just every band was was in my in my echoing in my head you know when i started working with alice you know i i really wanted to make sure that uh, you know when he made his comeback um it wasn't like he survived rehab it's like he came back this kind of nuclear version of it so so maybe that was one of my influences in terms of how uh, you know raise your fist and yell or that album you know ended up sounding like that um then I really wanted to work with some other writers, and I ended up fortunate enough to work with Desmond Child and uh, Diane Warren, people like that. And and so, you know, they have a massive influence, especially on like a you know a, a new kind of knucklehead that's trying to figure out what's <laughs> going on. So so you know, my songs you can tell that you know De Desmond's stamp is all over them and everything. But it was an equal effort in terms of writing and influence, you know, as far as what we put out. So. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I kind of think, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, those those experiences that you have don't start, don't stop, um, you know, accumulating and developing who you become. Mm -hmm. So I I've always thought to myself, and this is probably not the this is probably the best way to do it, but probably not the most uh, financially uh, secure way to do it is I always recorded what I wanted to as opposed to what I thought I should. So, uh, so yeah, so, you know, your, your question is like, did I know I was doing that? I knew I was doing what I thought was, was awesome. <clears throat> For example, the, the Saints and Sinners record, um, I uh, felt like I needed a lot of uh, vocal training. Mm -hmm. So Desmond hooked me up with this guy that had actually worked with Steven Tyler and people like that. And, uh, you know, that, that was sort of his influence, or I saw where I was and the type of music I was walking into, and I better get my act together. The first time I moved out to LA, I thought I was like the best guitar player in the world. And then suddenly I hear all these people and these guitar players, they're all fucking amazing, you know? So I go, because I got my, I got my work cut out for me, yeah, so. Um, in writing with Desmond, I actually was lucky enough to, um, I took like a rock and roll fantasy masterclass with him, right? I was oh. more one of the people that just kind of hung out and listened and other people. Sure, their sure. Songs. But it was phenomenal. It was three days long and he's clearly a very disciplined person. Yeah. And another thing I took away from him was um, that when he writes with somebody, he just kind of goes in with the mentality that it's 50-50. Um, was that, did that make it easier for you to work with somebody who I believe at that point was already established? I think Desmond was already established. He already he was established, yeah. That, there there was a time I, I walked in, I had gotten a publishing deal for, I think it was like 150,000, something like that. 
you know, advance. So I was going to kind of brag about it. And this is a true story. Yeah. And, and I walk in to write with him and he's sitting at his desk and he gets off the phone. And he goes, geez, I just signed a million dollar deal with <laughs> EMI for my publishing. And I went, yeah, I got nothing to tell you. <laughs> you know I mean, I just I didn't say anything. So, yeah, he was established, you know. And, and see, the thing about Desmond is, and I've said this before, is that, you know, if you have 15 minutes, mm -hmm. you'll leave with the song. In other words, it won't be 100 percent done. But if you're working in the, the verse, bridge, chorus, B section world, you're going to have most of the structure done. A lot of guys that play music, and I'm sure every musician knows this, you know, you, you, you hook up with certain people and you'll spend three hours there, you're drinking coffee, you're yawning, you're doing whatever, and you, you have like half a verse at the end of the day. He doesn't operate like that. For him, you know, being a, a monstrously talented person, he can he can get down to the hard work. You know, the other guy that's like that is is uh, Paul Stanley. Mm -hmm. He 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 had that same kind of uh, intense focus. You know, where where you're there to work and that's what you do. You know, really great guys. But but by the same token, if you're gonna you know turn your guitar on, make it uh, you know uh, significant. Is that your personal writing style when you're writing on your own? Yeah, when I'm writing on my own, uh, it's, it's very, it's, what, what happens with me is I get ideas when I'm driving in my car with them. So I try to record them, you know, as best I can with now with my iPhone. And the key is that you want to remember whatever chordal structures you're hearing in the background. So, uh, you know, I have this thing I do where I sing kind of intervals, you know, so I know what the, what the uh, tonic, ba uh, the, the chord structure is underneath to a certain degree. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I want to get to the end of the song really quick, but I know that, that it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a long process. I mean, my last record took me three years to record. So it's one of those things where I'm not like super, you know, fast, you know, like I'm not like a cookie cutter guy, you know, I, I just would never do that with anybody I'm writing with or certainly my own music. For the, uh, we'll jump ahead a little, for the new album that, that you said just took three years. Was it that you wrote a bunch of songs, recorded them, decided you wanted new songs, or is it that you just really took your time and made the album when you when you had all the songs that you wanted on there? Well, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily how many songs I had. Like when I found a song that I love, <clears throat> I knew I was going to pursue it to the end. <clears throat> Excuse me, and to, and to be to go against what I was just talking about. There's a certain business decision regarding that because you have a record company that's you know giving you money to to get it done and everything so there's a certain res responsibility frontiers was very uh, patient with me although i think the reason they were patient was i don't think they really liked me as an artist but i i think uh, you know i got the deal uh through kip winger so they weren't thinking you know my record was going to really make much of a difference especially their audience is very 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 80s you know uh and my my music has moved you know a little a little bit at an angle from that you know there's still an influence of all that stuff but it's it's moved away from it so what was happening was you know i hadn't been in the show so to speak for a while so i would sing something and i go yeah this sounds pretty good you know and of course a month later my voice was getting better you know every month that went by i started thinking hey my range is still here i can still hit these notes and you know so the music and some of the writing, of course, uh, began to uh, evolve. And um, I felt like that was the greater concern rather than, you know, hitting some deadline. Yeah, well, and you had taken quite a hiatus from, from professional music in terms of putting out albums and playing shows and that. Um, what, was the, what was the reason that you took such a long break uh, between, you know, Saints and Sinners era and yeah. now um well you know the the music industry see um everybody talks about how you know there was the 80s and then grunge came in and killed the 80s and then it went on to something else and you know all that thing well see for for me i felt uh, a lot of the music in the 80s you know it was kind of about time you know because you know i remember like when i first got into video games you know i had a you know either an atari or some you know old ass game like that and pretty soon everybody was making games mm -hmm. and, and most of the games sucked you know and so what happened was those those consoles died because you know the 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 video game industry was almost you know destroyed 
And I think with, with 80s bands, you know, there were so many songs about how beautiful some girl was, but they hated them because they didn't like the guy, you know, and I always thought, well, maybe it's you, you know, who knows? So, <laughs> so, so, you know, but after a while, it's like, ah, we, we needed, we need some more subject matter. And then, you know, when I, when I heard uh, 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 Nirvana, I was thinking, oh, this is fucking awesome, an unbelievable band. And then, you know, as the industry kind of got proactive and sort of moved, you know, like they did with disco and then they did it with the eighties, they sort of shoved it out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 Although it, it made sense to me. So my thought was like, well, what am I going to do now? And I'm, I'm certainly not going to put on a pair of shorts and get tattoos. And, you know, like, for example, Pantera is like an unbelievable band. You know, you can't go from, you know, A to Z like that and be a legit person. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the music industry it, itself, not playing music, not being with the fans, not doing any of that stuff. Uh, completely, you know, bored me at that point. I get it was at a really short shelf life with the way the industry worked. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just split and I went into other creative things. I've always been an artist, you know, I got involved. I was with, uh, I was executive producer at um, a company. We did uh, broadcast design, like short films. We had commercials on the Super Bowl and stuff like that. So I learned a lot about, you know, graphics and, and, and broadcast design and motion graphics and all these programs, which I still do today. And, and so uh, when I was hanging out with um, my friend Kip Winger, you know, he heard one of the songs that I recorded because I was still recording. Right. And he thought, you know, this is awesome. Let me give it to uh, the guy, the guy there, uh, I forget his name, at, at Frontiers. At Frontier. and, okay. What? Oh, at Frontier Records. Yeah, Frontage Records, but I can't remember the, the president's name. Uh, president Clinton, it was, he was the president of, uh, no, anyway, so he, um, so they agreed to do a record with me. So yeah. right there, you know, I thought to myself, all right, well, I'll get into it. And, and pretty much uh, I was uh, immersed in it. And, you know, you know, the thing is, you, sit, you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to do a record. I'm going to learn these songs. I'm going to write some stuff. I'll get my chops up and my singing and go in and record it just, for me, it always turns into a massive story, almost like a movie, you know? And so suddenly I've got Alice Cooper on it. I have Alyssa from Arch Enemy. Uh, I have uh, the drummer from, you know, Baby Metal. I got Nita Strauss on the record, you know, all these people. And it turned into kind of a bigger project uh, for me. And uh, I, it ended up being, you know, one of the most fun, one of the, the greatest records I think I've ever done. So I, I had a great time. That's amazing. I do wonder though, um... I mean, obviously the industry changed and it was funny to hear you say disco because I've been wanting to ask people, did, is metal disco? We, we, you know, did the same thing happen? Because it kind of feels like similar. Yeah, you know, it did. It, came it in, did. It got huge. There were tons of albums and then all of a sudden it just went away and got like- That's exactly what it was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, um, there, was, there was a political aspect to it too. Like the thing is that a lot of the people that are in power, and it's so funny because the people that were in power then still behave like they have the same kind of uh, impact or power that, you know, now, and they don't. This record, nobody knows what the fuck to do with the, with the music industry right now. So what they did was they fired everybody. They don't have to make CDs anymore. They don't put bands on tour. They don't do any promotional tours with radio. You know, for, for, for these record companies now, it goes, oh, we have like a whole uh, production uh, uh, promotion plan for you. Well, what is it? we're going to send emails to different websites that's the promotion plan you know right. so uh i think what's what's what is going to happen is that uh, somebody will come up with a different model but you know young musicians today have to think in terms less in terms of these record companies and more in taking uh, the bull by the horn so to speak and and uh interdicting into the culture <laughs> no but they have to they have to drill their own You've been way wanting to use that word all in oh my god you. no one, the middle of it is my interdicting <laughs> everybody goes whoa what's she talking about right, come on man. so right now i sometimes think of joan jett because i remember that story and it might have even been in one of the joan jett films or documentaries of her like literally selling you know uh cassettes or cds out of her trunk at some point point. and i'm wondering do you think the landscape right now is basically joan jett selling out of her trunk except you have all these cool tools to do it or do you think it's something different entirely well here's my thought on that you think of where musicians came from like what what 
what the actual role of a musician was. Well, many years ago, we used to stand on the side of the road with these little shoes that curled up with bells on them and we were playing a mandolin and rich, rich people would drive by and throw meat at us or fruit or say, yeah, oh, thing I can eat tonight, you know, bring home to my family. It hasn't changed, it never changed. In other words, the musicians were always getting the crap kicked out of them financially. And even the guys that make, if somebody made, you know, a good amount of money, you know, let's say whatever year with their album, the record company made 18 times that. I mean, it's just, it's just the way it, it's set up. And, and also just in terms of collecting money, you know, like uh, fortunately I did, I did a, a, a good amount of writing. So that's the real estate of the music industry. So I'm still getting money. From, from those songs, but by the same token, um, there's, there's a ton of money flying around out there under my name. And you can imagine the bigger artists, it just never gets collected because, because the, the, the actual uh, process of getting equity into the musician's hands is the most dysfunctional part of the music industry. In other words, they pay attention to everything else. So, I personally think that although the old model is now to my, my way of thinking is, is dead, you know, or dying, you know, um, and especially with this, these, uh, you know, it couldn't really survive this whole pandemic that we're involved in. I mean, the only way musicians were making money at this point, well, you know, we play live and whoever was lucky enough to be able to, to do a, a tour for six or eight or, you know, 10 months, those are the ones that we're doing well. Now they can't even do that. So that's gone. So, so what are you going to do? Turn to a record company like they're going to do something? They're not going to do anything. So, you know, in my the way I look at it now, the way I tell younger musicians is <clears throat> your only chance of making it in the music industry is like the way I was. No matter what happened, no matter what world you're in, it's the only thing you want to do. Mm -hmm. And you make you make your own future. You have to do that. And, you know, for me, it was like, oh, I got to get a record deal. I got to do this. I got to do that. And it worked out very well. But by the same token, you know, you just see yourself having to deal with these lawyers and they all know each other. or They're not working for you. They're working for themselves and the record. Company. You know, occasionally you meet uh, real people. And I think that's one of the uh, blessings of my life is that I met Chef Gordon and I met Alice Cooper because they're real people. And, and Ezrin as well. Bob and Ezrin and I didn't get along at first. And, uh, you know, I remember there was one moment I wanted to walk around a coffee table. Now, you got to understand, I'm pretty big at this point. You know, yeah. like, you know, I was like well over 200 pounds, you know. And he wouldn't move his legs, right? I said, well, you want me to step over your legs? And he goes, he goes well, if you have to. And I said, I don't think I have to. And at that point, he and I became best friends. That's, that's oh, Ezra. Okay. You know, he'll, he'll get right in your face, you know, especially if you're working with him. Mm -hmm. And then if you get past sort of the initiation of fire, you become friends and, you know, miraculously talented guy, you know. So, uh, uh, yeah. So I'm just saying that, that my advice is don't think about what everybody is talking about. Oh, the old model is, is, is gone. Therefore, there's nothing I can do. Right. You just have to look forward all the time and realize, and, and there was a jazz musician, a drummer named Art Blakey. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I think he's passed away now, but he had this incredible band. And of course, you know, jazz, it was tough to make money, you know, but that's, they're, they're, they were the ultimate warriors, you know, a lot of these black musicians. And he said, the only thing uh, that should be in your mind and heart and belief, the leap of faith that you have to make is if you get good enough, the world will beat a path to your door. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that I'm a perfect example of that. I'm not saying how good I am. I'm just saying, if you think about it, the way I looked and the way I played, mm -hmm. there was only one band on the planet that I could ever join. And that was Alice Cooper. And he found me, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, because, you know, I never played with anybody else after that. What do they want this like 230 pound guy with a <laughs> guitar that shoots flame? What are you going to do? You know, it's like, yeah. so, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's the, uh, that's the belief system that you have to maintain. It's just get amazing at what you do and uh, things, things will, I believe will pan out for your life the proper way. Yeah. What's interesting about your story is I've, talk to musicians who, you know, they had a backup plan, you know, their parents 
insisted that they do the BU thing or what have you, right? So they knew they wanted to be a musician, but they had the backup plan. Then I've talked to musicians who said, I don't have a backup plan at all. Like, this is what I'm going to do. You're, I kind of see you as somebody who's done both in the sense of, you strike me as a person who you decided you want to play music. You're going to do it your way. You're going to look the way you look. You're going to play the way you play and all that. But you also had other talents. So your early days, you knew how to deal cards. You know, you've been able to do video and, you know, like you have, you have other talents, bodybuilding and that sort of thing. Do you think having multiple passions is what has helped you be authentic as a musician and kind of only have to play the kind of stuff you want to play? Because I don't see you as somebody with a backup plan, but you have had, you know, sort of other sources of income. Over I always have faith that if uh, two things, one of them is, you know, you have to sort of be in touch with what you really want to do. And you have to you have to understand, you know, your your limitations of who you are and what your skill set is, is the spark for finding your own path in whatever world that is. In other words, I can only play a certain way. You know, I can't do what everybody else does. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you develop the, your own way that you sound, your own way that you play, your own way that you look. It's the same thing with, um, you know, writing lyrics, you know, and, and, and getting into, uh, you know, broadcast design. I knew I wanted to learn After Effects and Premiere and Maya and all these programs and all this stuff. And, and so uh, I was fortunate enough to get myself in a situation where I could learn from the best guys how to do all that stuff. So, and I knew at the beginning that I couldn't do like the, there's, this, this might be boring, but there's a thing in After Effects. It's this program that every film and everybody uses in order to put special effects on, on footage. And so there's guys now that can actually write script into the program. See, I can't do that, you know? So I have to sort of turn my camera towards something else rather than spend the 10 years or so to get good at right. that because I'll probably <laughs> be dead at the end of that. So, so the, 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 the point is that, that um, you have to look at what you're great at and you have to look at what you're okay at, you know, you have to look at the angles of life and let that, you know, kind of uh, guide you, be your sort of rudder to get to the uh, places that you want to go. There's no reason why you can only do one thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it's all part of the same creative engine that you possess. And, and, and that's the thing. It's like you look out onto uh, the world and, and your life and, you know, you don't have a lot of time but parts but but there there is something that you can do in the meantime and that is really study at the things that you think you're going to be good at and just do them all day i've always told everybody i don't want to you know go on too much about this but i've always told everybody that obsession is a good thing mm -hmm. you know if you become obsessed with the guitar you granted your girlfriend's going to leave you you know your friends you're not going to make a lot of friends your friends aren't going to want to hang out with you whatever but at the end of the day, you're going to come out with this, this really, uh, uh, this big accomplishment. You know, you have this guitar in your hands and you're playing the way or speaking the way with it that you want to. I think those are the important uh, motivations. Well, you've talked a lot about passion and also about being around good people. So I want to go back a little bit. When you had met Alice and um, yeah. Shep and Bob, Bob, Bob Ezra and all of them, when, when they hired you, I've heard of a few things. Obviously, they, they must have loved your playing. They appreciated your look. You got along with Alice really well. But when they, when they brought you into the fold, did they bring you in going, okay, here's this young guy. He's kind of a metal dude. We want to take Alice in this in this way or did you just come in as a player that alice wanted on um in his team and then did you just kind of did did you make no, they they immediately or did they know that they, they wanted you i know what you're saying they yeah. immediately transitioned me into his writing partner okay so so my first day working with him was writing and uh we started to actually develop a film that project and then it turned into the first album mm -hmm. and so basically you know shep's brain said we need to get a guy that's good for alice that has the writing skills that we like mm -hmm. you know that has this or that and you know one of the things is you know i didn't look like everyone else mm -hmm. so that's them you know that's yeah. the way they operate yeah, their original his alice's original band those guys didn't look like anybody, you know, and, and Dennis Dunaway. I've mean, been reading, just been reading this great book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, that's fucking awesome. But, but, you know, 
Dennis would have the base down to his ankle when he was playing. I haven't seen anything like that. The guy's like, you know, tall guy. And Neil Smith kind of personified the ultimate drummer rock star. And, you know, all the, all the guys in the band are really amazing band. So, um, you know, for me to step into that was a little scary. But the point was that they liked that I was, you know, off Broadway, so to speak. I didn't, I didn't look like anybody else. And of course, you know, Ezrin and, and Shep and everybody wanted to make sure that I was safe. You know, I wasn't like, I was gonna, wasn't crazy. You know, I wasn't something that I was gonna like suddenly blow up and, and do something. And Alice and I just uh, ended up spending, you know, a tremendous amount of time together. He lived at my house in Woodland Hills. We went to Maui for three months and wrote uh, Constrictor. And then, you know, it was just, we were always together and it was always, uh, it was always good, you know? Yeah. So I think that was, I think, you know, that, that slot that they wanted me to fit into ended up working out really well. And what was Alice's mentality? Because he had just played with these other guys that he'd literally known since he was a kid. And yeah. they kind of built this thing together. And now he's, he's working with them. Um, I assume you were younger than him at that point by yeah. 10 or so years. And now you guys are working together, you guys click and everything. But was he quick to like buy in? Was it sort of like we we know we want to go in this direction? Because to me, that seems like an awful lot of trust to put yeah. in somebody where you just heard like a cassette and said, okay, this is great. But to bring somebody in and start writing with them and you know basically have them be sort of like the musical director, you know. Right. Um, yeah. what what was his sort of reaction? Is he more of a go with the flow sort of guy? Was he ready for it? He 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 had uh, the notion because if you think about it, after, after that band. Uh, and the original band he went in a few different directions mm -hmm. and the last couple of directions weren't you know su successful in terms of you know Alice's true stature like what 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 he uh what he signified in terms of um, music culture and history mm -hmm. you know because he was all he was everything uh, that Led Zeppelin and David Bowie and all these guys were but he just kind of, he kind of, you know, got off the, the freeway, he took the wrong exit. So like, are you talking it wasn't about a celebrity appearance type of stuff, like a- Yeah, you know, everybody has all these Twitter different reasons. Stuff? I think, I think, you know, it was just a little bit of uh, substance abuse and stuff like that. It clouds your head. I mean, you know, even people that, you know, smoke a lot of weed, weed's very uh, popular now because, you know, it's legalized in a lot of places and everybody's spending so much time at home. You know, it's like, you know, do I want to watch TV? Or do I want to smoke weed and watch TV and have some frosted flakes? Well, who's going to go for the first one? No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm joking with you. Don't do drugs. No, but but the thing is that while you're doing drugs, when you're in that realm, like even if you're just smoking every other day or you, whatever it is, whatever it is, <clears throat> there's somebody who wants the same things you do that isn't doing that. And they're rocketing past you, you know? And, and Alice just let things get out of control a little bit. And the strength and genius of the guy can be seen that first show that's on uh, uh, The Nightmare Returns. It was like a VHS we did playing in Detroit on Halloween night. And he just comes out with this band that is full on metal and, and just tearing into his music. And he's twice as voracious as anybody on stage. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's way more like, beast like than everybody you know <laughs> so it just shows that that once he uh gets a feeling for what the momentum is of where he's going then he's feeding me i mean i'm not i'm not just there like guiding his career he's right. feeding me just as as much I'll, I'll never forget um there was a moment where we were working on the song prince of darkness for john carpenter's film and he was, I was working on the guitar, I was just playing and stuff. And the crazy thing, I'd pay, play a riff for him and see if he liked it. He was on the couch and he was eating Cheetos or something and for like 20 minutes. And then he came over and he said, hey, here's the lyrics. Well, if you listen to the lyrics to that song, they're phenomenal. And, and, and that's the thing about Alice is like, if you, if you catch his focus and he puts, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, 10% of what most people try to put into their work and their writing, he's going to come out with something absolutely stunning. And, and so, uh, so I, you know, I, I, I can't say I was the only influencer because he was, you know, I look at the world I, I entered, you know, so that world influenced me. And then, you know, you hang around with Shep for a while, you realize that, that, you know, these are kings of what they do. 
And so it becomes kind of a, 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 a state of life to inspire yourself to try to reach to some degree. So, so, um, so yeah, I would say it was a back and forth thing. I did become music director for, you know, all the theatrics and all the stuff on stage. Um, and uh, they liked it. So, and, and, you know, it wasn't just me, you know, I just, I'm saying Alice had a big hand in it as well, right. but we ended up being uh, in their mind at that time, exactly what Alice needed. That's amazing. Um, so at some point you did leave Alice's band and was that intentional? Cause I kind of get the sense that you had done a solo album while you were with Alice and then you did another solo album and that it kind of, it felt like that's where you sort of separated and went your way and he kept doing his thing. Was yeah, that- I, mean, I wanted to do, yeah, I wanted to do my own record. Um, and then, you know, when I got signed to uh, Geffen <clears throat> because of uh, Michael Alago, he's the guy that uh, signed me. I don't know if you know who he is. He just had a movie made of him called Who the Fuck is Michael Alago? But it was like a documentary. And, and, and you know, he signed, uh, and this is legit, he signed Metallica. He was there, he was the free gay, he's, he discovered them. He discovered White Zombie, uh, Flotsam and Jetsam, all these bands. The guy was, and then, you know, for some reason, he wanted to do a record with me. So, uh, you know, I, I was on MCA. And then when I got off MCA, he called me up and he said, hey, you want to be on Geffen? And I said, yeah, you know. So, so in the light of that, it was time maybe for Alice to make a change as well. And, and uh, so, you know, Desmond came into the picture for him. And then because it was a very incestuous bunch of, of creative people, you know, he ended up bleeding over and working with me, which I was very happy to do that. Well, you and, did Bed of um, Nails, I believe, on Trash. What, Bed of what's Nails? that? Bed of Nails. Bed of Nails, I, I played on that. I think I played on some other songs, but I didn't do any guitar soloing or whatever. So, um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, we wrote a little bit, but the songs didn't make it to the record. So, uh, so yeah, it, it wasn't um, it wasn't an uncomfortable separation. We were both, you know, our friendship was exactly what it was the day before I left. You know what I mean? So so that was the that was the important thing. And then I almost got back together with him in the '90s, but um, but I haven't done anything creative with him until you know my song on my new record and the video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was that like to to kind of partner up again? Except this time. It's like you're, you're, you know, you're sort of the driver, so yeah. to speak. Um, what was it like to work with Alice again after? I said, years? "Hey, look, buddy, you better, you better do your job. This <laughs> you time. better bring it. You better really bring it." Which, by the way, phenomenal song. It is um, my song obsession for like, you know, weeks and weeks now. It's like the only thing I want to listen to. And the video is phenomenal. And Alyssa White Blues is it? Is that how you say it? Her amazing. voice is amazing on that, and like so pretty when she sings like. Pretty. Oh, she, you know, it's, I, I have to tell you, like, uh, one of the things that I think is very true, and, and this is going to sound <clears throat> a little bit, uh, you know, esoteric, but you have to ask, you know, the things that you want. You have to ask life, you know, you say in your mind, I want to be this, I want to do this, I got to get to myself to do this, or whatever it is. You have to ask. You have to say, I want to do this. This is what I want in my life. And then the next thing you do for me is the more I legitimately become uh, engaged with something, it has a tendency to find its way into my life. So um, uh, a list is a perfect example of that. I, the first time I saw Arch Enemy, I hadn't even started my record yet. And I was thinking, wow, you know, this, this artist is phenomenal. And then I started hearing her legit singing. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where, you know, you, you wonder like, you know, is there any way I could do anything creative with this person ever? But then that notion just faded away, but I still was checking out her videos all the time. And I look at photos of her and I was saying, boy, you know, what, what an engaging uh, artist in terms of, you know, the, the, the way she looks, the way she performs and what her voice and all this stuff. So, Suddenly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of recording beginning of the end, and I did the whole vocal. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what would it be like if Alice sang these lines, because they, they seem a little bit like, you know, it was like corporate greed and all that stuff. And I went, you know, I, I, I'm not going to deliver that, I don't think, with the same kind of uh, historical um, uh, impact that Alice would, you know. So I, I remember I called him up. 
I was in the studio and I said, hey, could you sing on my record? I just have like, there's a song I really want you. And he went, yeah, I'll be right over. He was actually in town. So it was that quick. I didn't have to wait a month or till he got on tour or, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, so then I was getting ready to do my guitar solo. And I thought, what would it be like if Alyssa lands in the middle of the song and detonates the whole thing? <laughs> just like, just tears it up completely, you know? So uh, actually Michael Alago um, works with uh, Doyle uh, uh, from uh, The Misfits, who, you know, is one of my favorite people in the world, one of my favorite guitar players, by the way, absolutely amazing performer. His, his band, Doyle, people should check it out. It's incredible. And so he called up Alyssa and asked them, asked her about six different artists. And from what he says, he said that uh, she was interested in possibly writing with me. So I sent her, you know, some songs and she liked one of them. Mm -hmm. And then I said, hey, would you want to sing on a song? And she said, well, let me hear it. And I sent her beginning of the end with Alice on it. And she said, uh, I'll definitely do that. And so she handed back that performance, which I, I didn't touch anything. I didn't tell her what to do. She wrote some of her own words in it really phenomenal and then she said to me if you guys shoot a video I'll go anywhere to be in the video and I got um I found out Alice was recording in Vancouver I, I was playing in Vancouver and he had two days off so I said hey would you want to be in in a video and of course he wouldn't do that for anybody. He did, he did it for me is because, you know, we're friends and everything. Mm. But Alyssa flew from Europe to Montreal, waited four hours at the airport and then flew six hours or whatever it is to, uh, to Vancouver to be in the video. But, and and the, the, what that means is to me is just her commitment to art. You know, that's, that's what it was. She, she saw this project as something meaningful so that it was nothing, well, I don't want to say it was nothing, but for, in her mind, that's what she wanted to do. That's what she said she was going to do. And, and then she did it. And then finally, I, you know, I got uh, uh, um, Hideki from, uh, from Baby Metal to play drums on it because, you know, he's got this machine-like quality to his playing that I thought the song really needed. And if you listen to it, the drums and the groove on that song are, are at least 60% of its success. It's unbelievable. In terms of the rhythm section so my my point is that that just the way things evolve you know you get into a project and you know somebody was saying uh you know who do you want to get to direct well i almost called up oliver stone i'm serious like like in other words i'll ask anybody to do anything because all you'll hear is yes or no and and it could get complicated it could get weird it's just life and that sort of uh like like i said before you know, entering the unknown is what life is about. You know, you should, you know, you have to be uh, fearless on stuff like that. And I, I think that's what makes life kind of exciting. Are you working on a new album? Yes, I started, um, I started writing with some of the people that I wrote with before on, uh, on The New Normal. And you know, the new normal is, is very strange because it was 2019, right? I, yeah, I was thinking, and also the titles of the, some of the songs as well, uh, especially the one you did with Alice and Alyssa. It's it's like, how did you know, Kane? <laughs> yeah, and, and the cover is a girl wearing a virus mask that has spikes on it with blood coming off of it. And I, and I was like going, you know, Alyssa called me up and she said, do you, do you realize what's going on here? And I said, no. And she said, you have a girl with a virus mask on that mm -hmm. spiked the album is called the new normal mm -hmm. and our song is called the beginning of the end she said your next album could you just call it everything's okay now you know we were laughing so, unicorns and rainbows and <laughs> yeah i'm like i'm like a uh, like a two-bit uh, nostradamus or something like That's that you, you are yeah who knew but you but you already started working on music and yeah i worked i'm working on uh, uh, another record and i'm going to try to I don't know if I, you know, I have interest in another company. What I'm kind of struck with is coming up with my own business model for this. In other words, um, concentrating, like I, if I record five songs, they'll all have full production videos for them. Mm -hmm. In other words, I want to link the two together because I, I think trying to, to depend on Spotify and 
you know, all these other outlets in terms of streaming music and to try to, you know, uh, make it, you know, get, get the sort of uh, the proper reach into like the public. Um, I don't think you need a record company. I don't think, I don't think it's necessary. I think, you know, they have some, some relationships with some people where they can get the record into, uh, you know, different websites and stuff like that. But, you know, you think of it, it's pathetic compared to what it used to be. And, and by the way, these companies are doing what they have to do. I think there's a company called, there is a company called Nuclear Blast. It's very good. Some of these other companies, you know, they're, they're doing what they have to to try to get some sort of exposure. And, and, and look, they want you to win. Right. It's not like they're, they, they hate, uh, well, they might hate, I think Frontiers probably hates me at this point, but I'm saying I like- I you say that in other interviews. Do they really hate you or? Yeah, they do. Really? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Oh, yeah. I got, okay. I got some emails. <laughs> I would write back and say, look, take it easy. What are you, what are you doing? You know? Oh, that's But, so you know, they're, they're good guys. It's just, it, you see, what, what happens is uh, as, as technology changes, you know, um, it's, it's destroyed many industries. Like, you know, a perfect example is the printing industry. All these little yeah. shops used to have these, you know, you wanted to get like a sheet printed up. You had to go to some shop and buy the paper and they'd set the type and they'd do the whole thing. It started fading into, phasing into computer stuff and suddenly Hewlett Packard comes out with this $250 home printer. They're all done, you know what I mean? So, you know, you look at YouTube YouTube is constantly changing. They're reprogramming uh, YouTube literally every week. So the, uh, the people at these record companies, it's tough to keep up with them. There's a, a friend of mine that started a company called uh, movieclips.com. I think they sold to Fandango. But their whole trip was to make videos and have them go viral. That's how they made money. So they, had, they went from like a really small office to this huge office where they had a hundred boxes there with, with production teams at them and like trying to, you know, come up with the latest meme. And that's how they made money. And those guys understood YouTube was actually at their office all the time. Google as well. Uh, they, they sort of uh, had a, a sort of insider's view of how it operates. Well, most of these people at these record companies, uh, they don't, they don't have a clue. And they, they, a lot of them, you know, and in, in order to keep their jobs, they, they have to come across with an attitude. I'll never forget, um, somebody told me, like, if you give your tape, let's say, to a record company, and the guy says, well, I believe that the songs are very good, but I think you need another six months or so of writing, and, you know, let's see if you can get your Facebook uh, presence up a little bit. You know, they were talking like that. It's like, you know, probably what happened was their boss said, no more records for you this year. Your last thing you signed flopped. We, we just, we have three bands like this already. So they come across with this attitude, like they know something. Well, they, they, they don't, they don't really know anything. And there's, there's nothing, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but you have to be, it, it's, it's almost like if you're a doctor, you have to constantly keep up with the scientific journals right. and seminars and all that stuff. YouTube is moving right now while we're speaking. So the algorithms and all that stuff is constantly shifting. So it's tough to keep up with it. And so, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't um, you know, I, I don't criticize people for that. It's very difficult. But by the same token, you know, when they come across with a lot of attitude, it's like, you know, it's a, well, you know, I might say, fuck you, like off and on. And <laughs> they'll say it back to me. And that's what happened. Yeah. But, but you know, I, I, I look at Frontiers as, as kind of a miracle because the two guys there, and I don't remember their names, but the two guys that, that owned the company right. actually started it in their apartments and they're warriors. And, 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 you know, you have to have a true belief in the music in order to, you know, maintain for as long as they have. Mm -hmm. So uh, this new uh, environment that we're in, this new world, this new normal <laughs> that we're in is going to require some some young thinking, somebody's brains that are going to figure out a pathway to make things more equitable for everybody. And, you know, it, it's tough to find, you know, those people, those people that are that smart. So, yeah. Um, it's interesting that you um, are interested in going that video route, because like I said, I'm an 80s kid. I came up on, I consumed so much MTV and then yep. it felt like videos went away. And I actually, not too long ago, um, interviewed Richard Mays, who is the drummer of Lacuna Coil, but he's also in another- Oh, one band of my favorite bands. Loved, oh my right? God. Phenomenal, phenomenal band. Christina, and, yeah. um, 
Uh, he's in another band also called Genus Ordinus Day, and they did something really interesting in that band. They had put out an album with 10 songs and each song had a video and they all strung together to make like a basically a movie, cool. um, which I thought was really cool. Brilliant. I, thought, I thought that was really interesting, though, because, again, I I wonder, does anybody watch videos any anymore? You know what I mean? Like, is is this something is it something that's old, that's new again, because it's being put out in different well, ways? Well, What's see, see the thing that? is, you can't. I, I don't think people want to see somebody, you know, on the beach with a with a piano and the wind in their hair singing a song. Yeah, I don't think that that's going on anymore. I think I think one of the the things you have to think about um, is sort of the cultural shifts. Now, I, I'm not saying I have a full on grip of this, but for example, ownership is becoming less of a of a thing. I mean, today people don't want to own a CD or an album. They don't want to own a download. They want to stream it. So they don't even own it. They're just sort of renting the space. Right. It's the same thing with people that are less likely to buy houses. They don't want to own a car. They want to take Uber. They don't even want to you know, own the moment of going to a restaurant. They want the food delivered. And, and it's all, they don't even want to go to an office anymore. They want to do it with Zoom and all that stuff. And you're one of those people. No, I'm kidding. I am, I so, am, so, so, I am no, one of those people. <laughs> no, but but it, I think I think some of that will emerge as as, uh, as a good thing. So I'm thinking, you know, the, the key is that what do you have on your video that's going to want to make people watch it again, want to make people tell somebody else about it. My video with Alice and Alyssa, I thought um, would do better. I think we're at three hundred and fifty two thousand views or something, which is very weak for, you know, considering that those two are on it. Mm -hmm. So it just means that the initial launch in terms of YouTube was was a mess in terms of what the record company, how they handled it and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I for me, I, I'm not thinking, oh, I made the greatest song. I made the greatest video. I'm the biggest star. I just think just by proxy, it's tough to fuck up, you know, Alice and Alyssa on the same song because it's such a, a rare event and they both are phenomenal on, on the on the song. So um the, the, and like I said before, it's not it's not easy. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, uh, it, 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 in other words, so if you're going to make a video, you might want to make it 30 seconds. You know, maybe the song is two minutes, but the video is very short. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that sort of a thing. There's a lot of things to be concerned with to try to find the proper model for you. And of course, you know, like, for example, I think uh, Billie Eilish is, is, you know, she just walks in front of the camera. She does those songs and everybody wants to see it because it stuff's kind of incredible, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, so that's when it's the same thing happened with, let's say, Guns N' Roses. The first time I saw Welcome to the Jungle, I knew that that was a hit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I saw Axel and everybody doing that. I was like, this is fucking unbelievable. So it just it just depends. You know, you want to think of what is structurally going to be the most advantageous in, in terms of getting the most people to see what it is you're doing. So there's some kind of version that's that's beginning to evolve, and uh, hopefully I'll still be alive when it takes place. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy to see it because I actually do love videos and I love seeing people come up with different unique ways of presenting yeah. their music and their viewpoints, and I think it's pretty cool that people. Yeah, we're, I'm trying to do something so like like they what those guys were doing. Like my video, you noticed there was nobody scenes of people playing bass and guitar and stuff right. i wanted to make it more more cinematic more like right. a musical you should see the uh, i'll send you the director's cut please do. we're gonna we're, we're gonna put it out uh, you know relatively soon and you'll see that uh, you know i got some of my friends from back in the day to to edit it and put some extra sh you know shots in it and stuff it looks amazing so uh but did but yeah so on the video did you do, do any of the effects or did you just sit back and I did some of the effects, yeah. but but the uh, you know, all right. Listen, I never told anybody this. We, uh, I think, I think our director mm -hmm. had a nervous breakdown of sorts. Like oh, he, no. he kind of he kind of lost his mind. Like right before the production. Now I got Alice and Alyssa in Vancouver, and somebody's losing their mind in the project. So, oh, no. um, and then then you know I I got a bunch shot, but. Uh, he wasn't, a, I, st I, I said, I'd be in Vancouver for four days and then you can just shoot me after we get their stuff done. Right. So he was unable to shoot after the first day. So I don't have any more footage, okay? I, I don't even have me doing the whole song. So I have to sort of edit that. And then he wouldn't give me the footage for 
like three, uh, two months. Okay. And the record company's going, where's the video? Yeah. So it turned into this kind of, and, and this always happens with film production on any level. It, mm -hmm. it usually ends up being some kind of a, you know, nuclear bomb goes off somewhere in it. So, <laughs> um, so I wasn't that freaked out, but you know, we, uh, due to, um, pressure that I, uh, exerted, <laughs> he, he sent me the footage. Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, so, you know, that's one of the reasons why in my mind, uh, you know, I, I had to do some of the effects. I had to get my friends to help out, okay. but the director's cut was like, we were able to take our time, shoot a little bit more stuff and make the whole thing make sense a little bit more. So, uh, some of the holes in the story are, but, you know, for me, the whole key was to just, you know, present this, what I thought was an incredible song. And I thought the performances were unbelievable. And of course, you know, Anytime Alice or Alyssa hit the hit the camera, it's just it's fully engaging. So we were lucky in that regard. No, it was it was definitely a beautiful video, and uh, yeah. I'm thinking it was karma um, for you getting that footage late for delivering. What did I do? Late. What did I do? <laughs> delivering your album three years late. Yeah, I know. I know. I have such a bad attitude. I, I'm glad he did what he done to you. No, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. I um, I heard you. Um, it was Ryan Roxy's show actually, and you know, I feel like a lot of musicians really miss being on tour and being on stage. And you said something that was really different than what most <laughs> musicians said, which yeah. is something to the. And correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but that that you're kind of you're kind of cool with like just making videos um instead of you know playing smaller clubs or what have you uh do you is it that you don't miss it or is it that it needs to be like a certain kind of venue for you to to make the effort to get out there see ah, geez I, you know i, I don't want to i don't want to quote myself but you know i think you know uh, younger musicians right mm -hmm they have a different view of life. Mm -hmm. Their lyrics are different. You know, maybe it's because they haven't had as many years of experience, whatever it is, there's a certain blissful ignorance to who we are when we're 16 through 27, 28, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. And so our writing is going to only have maybe the more uh, innocent, it could still be very violent, Mm -hmm. But it, it speaks of the world in terms of the impact that takes place, like, you know, two trains smash into each other. Well, it's just that's the moment. And that's what you describe. Mm -hmm. You know, as you get old, when you're 16, you see a pack of bubble yum, and you stuff the whole thing in your mouth. In fact, in fact I still do that. That's but amazing. see, but but now, like you see, hey, you know what, I don't want to get a cavity. So so my, my point is, as you get older, the whole thing begins to change and the lyrics you write everything and the way you look so for me you know i always thought that rock was a young person's uh uh world you know that's the way i look at it and it doesn't mean that older people shouldn't play but you know what is a young guy or girl in a band right now what are they mad about they're angry young people well they're mad about the man they want to take the system down the injustices, the war, whatever it is. The reason why people with they're older than 50 are angry is their backs hurt. You know what I mean? So they're on stage like, ah, you motherfucker. You know, <laughs> so I'm just saying, I'm saying like, if I could find, you know, for me, like a legitimate feeling, like I get up there and I really deliver something that is, you know, beyond me trying to sort of like live in the past because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the past is a good thing. But, you know, you look at a really old house, you know, you go in there, the thing's falling apart. If you hang around there too long, and the right wind comes along, it could fall in on you. It's just, you know, and it's nice, you know, because these these older bands, you know, they're the soundtracks of our lives, you know, that, you know, growing up, all the emotional turmoil and the things we went through. And, you know, I, if I get a letter or, or a you know, message from somebody that says, you know, this album really got me through a, a rough patch in my life, you know, I, it's all very important, but... I think, um, you know, it's, I always think of it this way. Remember, I don't know if you remember uh, Jerry Lewis or Jim Carrey, you know, mm -hmm. unbelievably funny, you know, Jim Carrey, when he makes those faces, it's funny. Hey, you, you know, you get 55, 58 years old. It's not funny anymore. It's just kind of creepy when you make that face. So, <laughs> so it, I think the same thing applies to a lot of, a lot of bands. Now, some guys get up there and it's legit. 
Alice told me the worse I look, the better it is for my career. And he, you know, he's right. I mean, he's so fucking funny and he's amazing. I mean, he gets up there. He's his voice to me keeps getting better. I, I, it's, it's unbelievable. So there's certain people that can maintain, you know, whether it's a David Bowie, Mick Jagger, you know, any, it's, it's a very rare kind of a, a crowd to be in. So, um, if I could get on stage and not try to recall the past and try to come up with something new that let's say, you know, I can wear it properly and I look legit and it doesn't look like I'm trying to be something, you know, from 20, 30 years ago, whatever, then, you know, I would do it. And a lot of people think it's a very depressing message for me to give up, but I, I find it really exciting, you know, to, you know, do a video, do a song and do a video and film, you know, whatever, and give people that sort of a controlled environment. Playing live has got to be one of the greatest gifts of, of being a musician. It's just that, um, you know, I, I just want to do it in the proper uh, setting, so to speak. So, you know, uh, you know, I got a lot of things I could say, but everybody gets really mad at me when I say all this <laughs> shit, so I can't. So there's you know. still a chance that you might figure out that thing and, and give us a good tour, but until yeah. that happens. Yeah, like, you know, I, like for example, uh Kip Kip Winger and Ken Mary and I were thinking of doing like some kind of a trio, you know, and just doing like, you know, a, a video with a song and a couple of, you know, maybe a couple of shows or whatever, but you know, you can't play live anymore now. And you see, I, I don't see that coming back, you know, very soon either because of the uh talk to promoters. They're very concerned with the insurance because uh this this COVID thing, you know, who knows what the fuck all this is about. So uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think people should maybe focus on, you know, make a movie, you know, make a movie on, on these bands, you know, uh, like, like where can people see them and get like really, you know, feel the sweat of what they're doing again. Um, and that somebody's got to figure out a way to do that other than, you know, packing into a club or 80,000 people at Vakken, you know, and, and, you know, that's where, that's what Alyssa and Alice, you know, were doing. Alyssa, you know, Arch Enemy would, uh, would um, you know, headline uh, their night at Vakken and same, same with Alice. And it's the same thing with, for example, uh, you know, some of these other bands like, uh, you know, Shine Down and Five Finger Death Punch and everything. They're just, they're amazing. But, you know, the, the live thing has been kind of uh, ripped out from under them. Yeah. All right. Well, my last question for you. Mm -hmm. um, is even though you've kind of given some of this already, what's the advice that you have to musicians who are trying to navigate this new landscape? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the first order of business is, is making yourself great. That's the pressure. That's all of it. So, so every minute you put into practicing a scale or the rudiments on your drums or whatever type of instrument or whatever, producing, you know, whatever it is, you have to keep your standard uh, extremely high and realize that each minute feeds uh, the beast, so to speak. And, and so, you know, uh, everybody knows that thing of, oh, geez, I want to play a scale. So they play a simple scale and they can't fucking do anything. And then suddenly, you know, they get through the whole thing. It's that sort of gratification you have to do and have it expand into something, you know, it's kind of a miracle, you know, the process. So you got to just, you know, uh, you got to hunger for that. And then the, the other thing is you have to relate to like-minded people. You know, you don't, you want to associate with people that you believe uh, are ahead of you, or they have the same sort of pure motivation to do something great and have that be part of, uh, you know, what culture is and what people are. You want to put things out that are going to you know, enrich people's lives in some way, whatever that is. It's, I'm not making some kind of a rule on that. So I would say to musicians, you know, the, the, the basic premises haven't changed. Each business model has to keep changing, uh, but, but the, the premise of what you have to do to, to be successful is like in any industry. You just have to be really great at it. And, you know, there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, I, I, I don't, believe in God, or I believe in God, you know, whatever, whatever it is, all this religious stuff that's going, that, that people get into, every aspect of life requires a leap of faith. So you have to have faith in that process. Like I said, what Art Blakey said, if you're 
great enough, the world will beat a path to your door and, and you'll be, you'll be successful. You just, you gotta be, you know, tough. You just gotta make sure that you, you fight your way through it. And, you know, your parents are never going to say, well, this is a very sound uh, financial uh, career that I believe you've, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. Everybody's going to tell you, you suck and you're not going to make it, but you know, they suck. So, so that's not, that's my advice is to just, you know, not look at the past and think that's the way it's supposed to be. It's going to change into something. It's in the course of uh, transition right now. So there's an artist named Eito. He's a Japanese singer. And he came up with this incredible song and he just sings it with an acoustic guitar. And he didn't have a record deal. He put it on TuneCore. And I think right now he has 127 million views. And that's a legit story. He's a Japanese artist. I'm sure nobody's heard of him. But the point is, that's your path right there. You find out what's what's incredible about you. Do an incredible song and try to get it into the uh, the, the 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 public view, and then see what happens. Right, that's amazing. So everybody at home watching this, you need 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 to watch the beginning of the end because it is a beautiful video and listen to it because it's a phenomenal song and by the new normal. And then the yeah. director's cut is coming out uh, in the next couple of months or so. The next couple of months, we're just trying to find the right, uh, you know, I have, I have a marketing company that's gonna deal with it. So we're just trying to find the right moment. I have another one coming out called uh, Leave Me in the Dark. That's about uh, domestic violence. So we're, we're gonna, um, and that's, it's, it's another mostly- video? Uh, Another it's video? It's a lyric video, but it's got a lot of, you know, footage, a lot of it's really brutal. Okay. But um, but the last line of the film uh, that the uh, <clears throat> women say is "We bite back." So it's 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 kind of an intense you know video. It's pretty hot. So that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kane, for joining me. I've been a fan of yours for such a long time, and it's been such oh, a it's nice. Thank you, thank you for saying you. that. Yeah, that's very sweet of you to say. Thank you.